Hi there, it's Bean, and welcome to Great Moments in Weed History. You are just in time for our annual retelling of the history of 420. That's right! Just a week before the high holiday, we are bringing you the true story of this most exalted of days, including precisely how it came to be officially, unofficially, the one day of the year entirely dedicated to getting lit. That's right. Call out of work. It should be a national holiday. If weed is your sacrament, no work, just getting high all day on 420. As far as why this beautiful holiday exists, Well, no spoilers right now, but rest assured that 420 is not some kind of bullshit Hallmark holiday made up by the dispensaries and a bunch of slick weed brands to move product. First of all, the 420 tradition dates back to the early 1970s, so it is pre-legalization by quite a long stretch. Also, 420 is truly, and get ready for a weed pun, a grassroots affair, one that began with just five friends on a high-stakes search to find a lost weed garden. Now, if you've heard this story before, we hope you'll settle in again this year for a classic episode that Abdullah and I first released on 420 all the way back in 2018. And if you've never heard this one before, please prepare yourself for a bong-warming tale of friendship, weed, and weedy friendship. What's my plans for 420 this year? Thanks for asking. I'm going to be in Los Angeles for a few really, really fun events. First, on 419, I'm going to be at the world-famous comedy store in the audience to spend 420 Eve with friends of the podcast, Mike Glazer and Billy Wayne Davis, as part of a special night of stand-up that will ring in the holiday at midnight. So this is 420 Eve rolling into midnight, celebrating 420 at 12.01 a.m. and keeping it going strong from there. Tickets to that are available via the Comedy Store website if you happen to be in town in Los Angeles. And then on the big day itself, I'll be a part of the Mega Sesh, which is a special live stream event hosted by another friend of the podcast, comedian and improviser, John Gabris of the always excellent, always top shelf, high and mighty podcast. You can go back and check out some episodes of H&M that I've been on and you can get tickets to the Mega Sesh live stream and watch it all go down while you Mega Sesh at home on 420 or with your friends. And for more info on that, go to moment.co slash high and mighty Get your Mega Sesh tickets now. Get lit on 420 with myself, Gabrus, and a bunch of really cool comedians who all love cannabis as much as I know you do. And then, fresh off the Mega Sesh, I will be heading to a spot in LA called Two Bit Circus, which is a self described tech infused indoor leisure complex. They've got virtual reality, they've got arcade games, they've got pinball, one of my favorites, they've got escape rooms, and this is a free event presented by our friends at Green Street. It's going to have live music, comedy, weed sponsors, and yours truly will be hosting a special weed trivia contest. I cannot tell you any of the questions in advance, but I can tell you that if you are a longtime listener of this podcast, you will probably do pretty well at this trivia contest. For all the details on that whole extravaganza going on in LA, go to 420experience.com. And yeah, if you're in LA and you dig this show, please Come check out that party, say hi to me, get down on some pinball, and play some weed trivia. Let's go! Also, I want to just do a quick shout out to all of our new supporters on Patreon who signed up last week after last week's Weedathon episode. And also, of course, a huge and sustained thanks to all of our longtime supporters on Patreon who have been helping us keep this show on the air. If you want to join the party, if you want to join the fam, if you want to get high on history, every single weed on every single Weedness Day, that is all happening at Great Moments in Weed History. 
dot com. You could put five on it. You can put a little more on it and get a signed copy of my book, How to Smoke Pot Properly. And if you just want to get in touch and send a little feedback about the show or you want to wish me a happy 420, I'll wish you one right back. You can send an email to info at great moments in weed history dot com of course like subscribe give us a little review and most importantly when you are getting lit this 420 with your inner sanctum weed crew or out in the world at a big weedy event please tell people invite people recommend to people be the human algorithm that we need to suggest Everyone come check out Great Moments in Weed History. We are blocked on every other form of human communication except sesh to sesh. It's like the peer-to-peer of getting high. So please uh, do us that solid. Now, as always, there's going to be a moment in this episode of Great Moments in Weed History where I invite you to hit pause and use that time to get yourself properly lit in advance of the incredible cannabis-fueled adventure we're about to embark or spark upon together, snuck in a weed pun. Uh, but before we jump in the old hot box time machine and dig into the history of 420, our annual retelling of this amazing tale, I do wanna hit pause myself right now to say hi, hello, and welcome aboard to our newest sponsor here on Great Moments in Weed History, The PAX. Those of you who are watching this podcast instead of just listening to it because you're supporters on Patreon and you get the video version, you could see I just started warming up my own personal PAX. And while it gets ready, I'm going to tell you that PAX is the premier cannabis vaporizer on the market. Look, it's already ready to puff. They've been in business for more than a decade, providing a sleek, high-tech option to ingest cannabis, flowers, or concentrates in a discreet, healthy way. I've personally been puffing on PAX products since they first came out and changed the game. I'm going to puff on this one right now. This is my PAX 3. Yeah. And starting with next week's episode of Great Moments in Weed History, you're going to be hearing all about the PAX. But for now, I'm just going to keep puff, puff, paxing on some of my homegrown as we head back in time to Marin County, California in 1971 to meet a weed crew called the Waldos and hear the incredible true story of how they created 420. Hello, it's Abdullah and Bean. And welcome back for yet another edition of Great Moments in Weed History. Now, on this podcast, my colleague Bean and I, who are both cannabis journalists and media makers, go through some of the more fascinating points in the very, very long history of cannabis. You should know before we get started that Bean has done the research and written up the story. I have no prior knowledge of what we're about to talk about. So join us as we smoke some weed and discuss something really, really cool in the long history of cannabis. Bean, what do you have for us today? Oh, uh, I got a really fun story today. And uh, here's a little riddle. Today's great moment in weed history is literally a moment. An individual moment, an instance, a second, a split second even. One way to think of it, it's it's a moment in time. It uh, happens every year. It happens twice a day. Okay, so I think uh, I have some idea of what you're talking about. There are a couple of individual moments in the day that are very, very special to a lot of stoners. And I think the one that we're talking about right now is 420. Is that right? Yeah, check your calendar. It's coming up. Yeah, that's right. It is indeed right around the corner. The highest holiday, as we like to call it here. So, you know, 420 is something that appears so much in cannabis culture. Uh, it's basically become the most well-known meme around cannabis. And every single day, a lot of people light up at 420 p.m. and you know, the really dedicated ones, AM as well. I've definitely been in that boat sometimes. But a lot of people don't know what is the real story behind 420. What is the significance of this number? And I think we're about to find out. We are definitely about to find out. But uh, do you know what my favorite, one of my favorite 420 memories with you is? What's that? 
Um, we have a lot. We definitely have a lot. Yeah. <laughs> it was it was April 20th. It was the big 420. Mm-hmm. It was in Denver. It was at that huge cup. And I was trying to meet up with you to smoke at 420 oh on my 420. God. We are the people you think we are, <laughs> just so you know. <laughs> we are the stereotypes personified <laughs> yeah. as I like tap this J yeah. down. <laughs> and I sent you a text message that said, I am underneath the giant inflatable butane can. And I said, uh, the blue one or the red one? Because <laughs> <laughs> they were on opposite sides of this very large event. And uh, that's when I think I thought to myself, well, we're, 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 we're going to win this thing. Yeah, you know, that was a really hopeful time when we met. You know, it was a, a big time of flux for, for cannabis. I was new to covering cannabis. You have been in it for a long time. And we had a lot of really fantastic moments around this one specific time. So let's crack it open and find out the story behind 420. So here, what I'm hearing is that you got that J ready to go. Oh, yeah. Uh, Everyone at home, now is the time to hit pause if you need to roll one or pack one or get it ready however you kids do with the dabs. Because it's time to journey back to another great moment in weed history. Take a fat pull on that, Jay Bean, and tell me a tale. Gladly. Every year on April 20th, a.k.a. 420, and if you really want to, it's, you know, fourth month of the calendar, 20th day of that month. You know, people in Europe are, are like, what? Yeah, thank you. They have the metric system. They have no idea. <laughs> no, they put, the, they put the date before the month. Yeah, that's that's metric. Centimeters, uh, you got your <laughs> this, liters. This is from a man who has uh, a tattoo of inches marked off on his arm. Yeah, that's true. And who grew up in Asia, <laughs> incidentally, <laughs> with the metric system. Go figure. Okay, so every year at 420, cannabis lovers celebrate their favorite plant with festivals, protests, marches, and smokeouts, great and small. The tradition has even gone mainstream with brands like Ben & Jerry's, Burger King, and Denny's latching on to the marketing potential of a day where people get extra high. Right. Yeah, of course. I mean, you know, that's something that you see more and more now. I think we started seeing it in the 90s, right when the really, really intense prohibition mind state started to sort of soften and melt away. All these brands, very often brands who make really unhealthy fast food, (laughs) would play into the stereotype of, you know, stone people uh, loving flavorful snacks and would sort of peddle it and be like, are you out late at night with your homies? And, you know, hint, hint, you know, nudge, nudge, wink. And yeah, if you are one of those people, like, dude, that hits you dead on. So my, my favorite of these was two years ago on 420, Chipotle tweeted out the single word dank along with a photo of a taco bowl That was captioned, sometimes you just need a huge bowl to get through the day. Whoa, suggestive. Chipotle definitely recognizing their audience. You know what I mean? I think (laughs) that Chipotle is like, you know, lined up with stoners. I remember snapping a picture on the first day of recreational sales in Colorado of a uh, dispensary. And there's a line outside of it. And, uh, you know, I didn't even notice that there was a Chipotle in the background. And every comment was like, yo, that Chipotle about to come up. <laughs> <laughs> well, I I went in once and I was pretty sure the guy who made my burrito was a stoner because he licked the flap. Before he <laughs> and I, I didn't think that was, you know, uh, you know. Well, yeah, force of habit. Man. Yeah, you, force you of habit. He, stop looked, that. he looked sheepish. So I think he was <laughs> Wasn't supposed to do that. Um, so what are the origins of this high holiday? I, I, I'm guessing you have some broad outline of the story. Yeah, so I, I, I have a vague idea, but I'm definitely curious to learn more and sort of fill in the gaps here. All I'll say beforehand that I know about it is that it seems like, you know, the kind of thing that was a widespread meme or trend among a lot of people that became a thing. But what's interesting about a lot of cannabis culture is it starts with a very small group of people. And from those people, it catches on, you know, it it goes viral as it might. You know what I mean? And this is something that occurred in the days before the Internet. 
And definitely in the days before it was okay to publicly talk about cannabis in the United States, right? So what we're seeing is a microculture, right, which we've all had with our friends as stoners, becoming part of cannabis macroculture. And that's fucking interesting. And even beyond cannabis culture, it's, it's like I said, Burger King. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I, you know, we don't need to get too into it, but I have some mixed feelings about corporate America. Oh, 100%. You know, using, using our culture to, that's, you know, cultural appropriation is an interesting thing. And it gets, you know, there's mm-hmm. a lot of aspects to it, but there's definitely an argument to say, like, that's what Burger King's doing. They didn't do anything to legalize pot. They're a bunch of corporate people. So, yeah, like you said, this this 420 tradition took root and spread as an entirely grassroots phenomenon, one that long predated the Internet. Um, so naturally, a lot of myths and misconceptions have cropped up about how the whole thing got started. For instance, big one. You may have heard that April 20th is Jerry Garcia's birthday. And Hitler's. That's the one yeah. that <laughs> always it, comes up. Yeah, it's not Jerry Garcia's birthday. Uh, it's not. Okay, cool. But, so it, that, is, that's a but it is Hitler's not cool. Yeah. yeah. It happens to all be Hitler's birthday. I mean, I, I, as far as I know, that's not related to the reason of why it's, it's a <laughs> cannabis holiday. Oh, who's being naive yeah. now? <laughs> Put on your tinfoil hat because we're going deep yeah, into right? how Nazis started 420. <laughs> That would be such a bummer for, like, the entire world. <laughs> and I'm used to saying, like, oh, if, you know, if you don't agree with what I'm saying, that's cool. No, but if you're a Nazi, just stop listening. Yeah. <laughs> I don't fucking need you. If you're we like, We I, don't need the numbers that We bad. know there's weed-smoking Nazis. We're cool with the weed smoking, but not the Nazi part. Not the Nazi part at all. So Didn't Jeff Sessions say something along those lines. <laughs> he no, said, he said the opposite. No, he was he, like, the Klan is cool, except that they smoke pot. Yeah. Which is wildly out of whack. Yeah, I would say we take the reverse position. Yeah, the, the, the weed smoking is the coolest part of the Klan. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa, that's. <laughs> In our next segment, the top 10 cool things about, about <laughs> terrible things. Uh, um anyhow anyhow okay see the uh yeah let me pass that back to you i definitely parked on it ding ding for a park you may have heard it's jerry's birthday it's not it is hitler's another popular misconception is that 420 is the official police code for pot smoking in progress uh yeah apparently that's a myth that is it is true that that is a myth but you know it's Entirely understandable that our community would want to either honor a culture hero like Jerry Garcia or sort of transform this tool of our oppression at the hands of the police by taking over 420 and changing the meaning. So, like, I love both those, but neither of them are true. Right. The good news is the truth is actually way weirder and sort of more endearing and fun than either of those myths particularly when we delve down into the details. Awesome. So regardless of of 420, happy next birthday, Jerry Garcia. (laughs) Rest in peace, respect. Uh, And let's find out what happened. Yeah. Okay. So it all began in the fall of 1971 in San Rafael, California, when a group of wisecracking, weed-smoking students known as the Waldos got their call to adventure in the form of a treasure map. Like I was saying, it really was just one group of stoner homies. There's a line you can draw back from a lot of your favorite like TV shows and bands and all kinds of art and expression. The Rolling Stones were all friends when they were teenagers. You know what I mean? Like they all sprung out of one place together. They were the kids that they knew. Right. And and you know, that's not where all great art comes from, but it's a thing. It's a powerful force. Oh yeah, yeah. and I, I think you see that in comedy for example. You know what I mean? It's sort of like these groups of comedians that form a little culture that everyone's fascinated by. Their inside jokes become real outside jokes. Yeah, and that's exactly, I mean, that's right where this story is heading. So they get this treasure map. One of the Waldos had a friend whose brother was in the Coast Guard at the time, stationed nearby at the Point Reyes Lighthouse. For years, this Coast Guard cadet had been planting a small patch of pot in a forgotten area of federal land near the remote outpost. But as harvest time drew near this time around, he got paranoid about his commanding officer busting him. Hmm. So he drew a rough map showing where to search for the pot patch 
and gave the Waldos permission to keep it all for themselves if they could find it before the weather turned or the buds just like rotted on the vine. Wow, truly an adventure of Stand By Me proportions, but with a way sweeter prize than a dead body. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, so, so basically, I mean, come on. You hand a bunch of young stoners a friggin' treasure map, it doesn't matter if there's a bag of gummy bears at the end of it. You're going on that adventure with your homies. But in this case, there's a real fucking prize there, man. There's a bunch of weed. It, it has that stoner comedy-ish. It's almost like on the nose. Like, are you doubting this story a little bit? Does it seem like the origin story that you might make up? Yeah, you know, th- th- that's funny that you would mention that. There's elements of it that feel like a mid to late 90s, like, you know, like bunch of buddies movie, you know, road trip. I hope. It's true. And, it, you know, th- the funny thing is California, especially back in the day, is kind of a whimsical place where this kind of crazy shit would happen. And I would venture as far as to say that a lot of the tropes that, you know, we see as tropes in cannabis were at one point real things in cannabis right <laughs> here in California. Like you might not see a guy dressed as a wizard walking around nowadays, but there was, you know, smoking out of a Gandalf pipe. But that guy was a real thing in California. Oh, he's the mayor where I live. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but my, uh, here we'll get into it a little bit. But there is so much documentary evidence to back up this story. Really, I, you know, I've been a journalist for fifteen years. Like, yeah, you're uh, like, show me the beef. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, uh, well, where's the beef? Where's the beef? <laughs> show, <laughs> show me, me the beef. Show me the beef. I'm not even asking. I'm gonna give the evidence it's due when we need it. But don't no need. I, I, if you believe my word, there are letters. Backing up uh, key aspects of the story, there's mentions in their yearbook of 420. There's a flag that was made in their art class celebrating 420. Cool. Um, They have since tracked down the person who gave them the treasure map who was lost to them for like 30 years because he was like a friend's brother-in-law. Right. You know what I mean? He Part of why he gave them the map is they were far enough... He, yeah, I, I love this guy's story because there's something so beautiful about somebody who has been tending these plants and loving these plants and gets so scared that he doesn't want to do it. He thinks his commanding officer is going to, like, follow him mm. and knows. But he can't bear the thought of these plants not being harvested and enjoyed. By someone who would love them. By yeah. someone who would love them. And and it and obviously history tells us it fell, you know, this map fell in the right hands. Yeah, incredible. So, I mean, this is like super well documented, but we still don't know exactly how they arrived at this magical number, 420. So uh, what happened? Okay, so with the treasure map in hand, by prearrangement, The Waldos met at 4.20 p.m. on a fateful autumn afternoon under a statue of Louis Pasteur to get high and gather their forces before setting out in search of the secret weed garden. No kidding. So they arbitrarily picked the time 420 or just worked out for everyone or what? There's five Waldos. Um, So they're not like a huge, they're a crew, you know, five people is what fits in a car. You know, that's your crew, that's tight, that's your smoking circle, that's the Waldos. So one of them was like, I got uh, sports practice, let's out at 410. Right, okay, sure. So it it was essentially arbitrary. It was like, this is the most convenient time for all of us. Bam, we meet at 420 on the dot. On the dot, under this statue of Louis Pasteur, which exists uh, to the day. I have not made the pilgrimage, but uh, it's out there. Yeah. Um, th- that's where, like, you know, like weed aficionados meet fans of pasteurization <laughs> for like the annual pilgrimage. They're like, you know, it's like the guys, you're there, like, shedding a tear, and you see another guy who's like drinking like a carton of milk, you know, and it's like <laughs> shedding a tear. Yep. You know, and they hug. <laughs> and, and, little known fact, Louis Pasteur. Uh, his birthday was 420. No shit. Yep. Boom. Boom. Full circle. Same as Hitler. <laughs> yeah. It turns out. <laughs> Very popular day to be born. So as 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 mentioned, you know, this all sounds like I'd say a really good plot of a stoner comedy. You know, if I was green lighting, I, I definitely want to hear more. Yeah. You know what I mean? I'm not I'm not ready to like, you know, yeah. sign off on this, but I want to hear. Yeah. More. I mean, five people, they're like, that's rusty. He's sort of like, you know, a bad seed, you know, <laughs> like, you know. 
And that's little Johnny. He's super innocent and a country bumpkin. <laughs> you got like your five Waldos. That's Brooklyn. He's yeah. going to die. The guy Brooklyn always dies in yeah. the World War II movies. <laughs> so far, you know, this all sounds like the plot of a stoner comedy. But the Waldos didn't see themselves as Cheech and Chong types. And this is from their website. And all I can say is they have a pretty kick-ass website. We were motivated, creative, active, driven, involved, aware, intelligent, fit, and educated. The Waldos were social satirists and never mean-spirited. Interesting. So they're like a bunch of, you know, quirky, smart dudes, you know, altruistic. I, you know, th- that that makes me think of my crew in college. You know what I mean? I think those are all the qualities we would like to think everyone else thought of us, right? <laughs> like Like any good college crew. You know, like we felt enlightened because we were doing psychedelics and, you know, discovering that. And we felt, you know... We're thinking things we never thought. We felt like weirdly enlightened and then like to think that we were more like thoughtful or intellectual or something, you know, in in some way. You know, I I think a lot of people would look back on their college crew or their young crew and be like, yeah, you know, we were like we were a team. You know what I mean? In a way that you almost can't be a team anymore once you grow up and get your own individual responsibilities, you know? And just that time. And and then who does get to do that is these creative groups that go on, like we said, and and make things together. If you can sustain that. Yeah. Then that's that's the life. You know? And I think there's an openness to being in that kind of crew because you can be experimental when it's five people who just yeah ha- have have all signed on for weirdness together. And they made something lasting. I mean, I don't think that uh, you know drawing a vagina on Dave's forehead again and again, like we did, was ever going to catch on and become like a, you know, international stoner meme, right? But it goes to show these guys came up with something sticky. They all took the name Waldo. So there's like Waldo Dave and Waldo Steve, and that's how they referred to themselves. And there's uh, all these levels of sort of, like you say, these in-jokes that build upon themselves until... You know, I think one thing about being a stoner is, like, the default world is not made for you. Mm-hmm. First of all, they are out to get you, particularly, mm-hmm. you know, if if it's not legal where you are. Yeah. And then it's just a world made by, by square people who are lame. Yeah. So that instinct to create your own world with your f- group of friends... Totally. ...is, is awesome. To be forced into these constraints, right? If you're a creative person, constraints can actually be very liberating. It's in those, within those sorts of constraints that you come up with, you know, really wild and interesting and funny and profound shit. That's the really interesting thing about, you know, modern stoner culture, right? Is like everything in America that's above ground, above board, it's homogenizing, right? The same way that you're going to see targets on every main street and every town in America, you know what I mean? Like, as cannabis becomes more mainstream or more ubiquitous, we really are losing a lot of microcultures that are only going to exist in our memories. And this is stuff that, in a lot of cases, predates the internet and was always in the shadows because cannabis was in the shadows and cannabis users were, their use was in the shadows, right? So, like, legit, think about all of the, you know, thousands of, like, cultures that were lost, not only from this era, but from eras bygone, because you know that thousands of years ago, there was a group of kids who sat around and got high together and probably came up with some of the shit that we still are using today and don't even know where it came from. And I just think I get to see your point about the microcultures. Like I, I had a section in my book called Keep Pot Weird. Plug it. It's called uh, How to Smoke Pot Properly, A Highbrow Guide to Getting High, available wherever finer books are sold. Lincoln Uh, boy! (laughs) But uh, I made a whole section of it, Keep Pot Weird, because I see this coming. There's something inherently weird about pot, but there's also the weirdness of being pushed to the margins. Now that it's this big marketing machine starting to gear up, there's parts of it that I'm fearful of. Yeah, stay out of our sauce, Burger King. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, should we get Should we get back to the wall? Yeah, let's do it. Okay, so they get together under this statue. It's 420, the first 420 as we know it. Together, the Waldos spent weeks searching for the secret weed garden, only to come up empty each time. Oh, man. 
So they couldn't find it despite the treasure map and all signs in the stoner movie pointing to these guys are totally going to find the treasure. They didn't find it for a minute. Maybe the treasure is their friendship. Ah, the journey itself, <laughs> yeah. huh? One of those. Yeah, not, oh, spoiler alert. Yeah. <laughs> to life. <laughs> <laughs> but they don't find it. You know, it, it, it's it's not a big, like, commercial thing. This is like this dude's 12 plants. And it's in a very vast, remote area. So it's like needle haystack time. Right, um, and right. all they have is this dude's, like, there's a rock. And there's a tree that's, you know, next to a tree. Right, right. Somewhere around there. So so essentially, I mean, it is, it just, I'm sure every time they came up empty, it just built the legend internally even more. And, you know, put more glory in the eventual finding of this patch. Even though, you know, they're coming up empty, the outings served their larger goal of packing into a 1966 Chevy Impala and having grand adventures they called Waldo Safaris. The search for this cannabis treasure is just serving as an activity for, for these guys to, like, you know, to get down and do something fun. It's both. So uh, as the weeks go by, passing each other on campus, they took to using the phrase Louis 420 as a coded reminder of their meeting time and place, whenever a new search party was organized. Eventually, they dropped the Louie, and sadly to say, uh, they never found the weed. Really? Interesting. So they never actually came upon, uh, you know, El Dorado. You know what I'm saying? They never... uh, Wow, that's kind of a bummer. But, you know, so, you know, we know how 420 was born, but how did it end up becoming such a staple? Yeah, especially without a happy ending tacked on. Would you have, if you were making the movie, are you like, oh, the treasure is your friendship? Or are you like, the treasure is your friendship, but I want to see them find the weed? Yeah, no, I would fictionalize it to have the payoff. You know, if you're asking me as like, you know, a guy writing a story, I would be like, in that, there would have to be some sort of payoff. But, I mean, there would have to be a little, you know, sort of second stakes going on too there. You know, that it's not just them eventually finding it or the trials and tribulations of that, but that there becomes some increased challenge. Like, I would say that the commanding officer or whatever, the government, essentially arrives there at the same time. And there's, you know what I mean? A little, uh, they catch them in the act or something, and they have to, like, do a little switcheroo to get out. But, you know, clearly, uh, sometimes the truth hurts. And uh, for the the Waldos, uh, that meant they didn't get to find... That patch of cannabis. But indeed, they had established the 420 thing, and especially without a really good kicker for their story, how the fuck did they turn it into an everybody thing? Here's how one of the Waldos explained it to Huffington Post's Ryan Grimm in 2010. Now, I want to say a shout out Ryan Grimm because he did a lot of reporting on this So here's what one of the Waldos explained to him uh, back in 2010. I could say to one of my friends, 420. And it was telepathic. He would know if I was saying, hey, do you want to go smoke some? Or, hey, do you have any? Or, hey, are you stoned right now? Just from the way I said 420. And nobody else knew what we were talking about. Right. I would be like, bro, I don't give a shit if you're stoned or not. Do you have weed? (laughs) (laughs) I give a shit if I'm stoned or not. Make me stoned. But yeah, no, that that's hilarious. I mean... Because now, obviously, this would be a very not clandestine way to be like, hey, 420? You know what I mean? Like, everyone would know what you're talking about. In the first days of 420, it was code language. Yeah, there were five people who know what it meant. Right. And they were all into it. They're all named Waldo. So what happens next? Yeah, so how does sort of this silly in-joke become a global phenomenon? It happened the same way high-quality cannabis seeds spread from Northern California to the rest of the country back in those heady days of the early 1970s. In the pockets of cargo shorts? (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah, Closer, warmer. Yeah. (laughs) Oh, festivals? Well, the Grateful Dead. Okay, yeah, yeah, sure. There you go. festivals (laughs) festivals <laughs> basically <laughs> they kind of invented them <laughs> yeah, you know yeah. What I mean? okay gotcha oh so you know like a lot of things i feel like the grateful dead always find their way into american cannabis lore and here they are popping up again so so uh it was on festival tour really that 420 spread 
The Grateful Dead play a huge role in spreading all these things. Um, so according to Waldo Dave, the Grateful Dead had this rehearsal hall on Front Street in San Rafael, where they live. So we used to go hang out and listen to them play music and get high while they practiced for gigs. There was also a place called Winterland in San Francisco, which is like a concert venue, where we'd always be able to get backstage. And whenever somebody passed us a joint or something, we'd say, hey, 420. So it started spreading through that community. Interesting. So basically, these guys were hanging out at shows and saying it back and forth to each other. You know, as for a set of numbers, it really rolls off the tongue. 420, 420. It's easy, you know, like it's easier than... 515 or I don't know. You know what I mean? They're going to be. Uh, I don't want to yeah. smoke pot at 515. Yeah, you know, and imagine that if, if Waldo Bob got out of fencing class a little bit later, we could have been saying 440 or 510. But none of those f- really feel quite as good as 420, right? It has it has sort of rhythm to it. Yeah. You know what I dig about it is, you ever heard that that expression like, oh, it's five o'clock somewhere or like. Yeah. Like it's that, 420 somewhere is totally a phrase now. Yeah, you know? absolutely. Yeah. But also it's like built into that idea is like, okay, now I'm done with work. I immediately want alcohol. Which implies pretty strongly, I hate what I'm doing, and I'm going to get alcohol into my brain as fast as I possibly can to subdue all the bad feelings Mm -hmm. about being trapped in this worker's nightmare of a life. Yeah. Smoking at 420, it's so fun. It's arbitrary. You Mm -hmm. know what I mean? It's whims, like you said, it's whimsical. It looks good on the clock. It looks good on the clock. It's It's like, yeah, it looks like, it looks like a pair of fingers be like holding a J and the face of the clock being like, yeah, like, yeah, it's all good. Yeah, you know, it's like holding the J in front of its face. You know what I mean? But it's like about having your own time yourself, like Mm -hmm. ownership of your time in life. Yeah. And not being on that clock. Yeah. You know, 420 is not the time of somebody who is like on the clock. Yeah, exactly. Because if you think about it, it's like if you work a regular job, 420 is probably the last time that a conventional person can smoke. Because it's like, you know, an hour before you get out of work, essentially. (laughs) You know what I mean? That's not the time that you're going to get up and be like, I'm going to go burn one in the parking lot real quick. But if you are a true cannabis head, then fuck yeah, 420 is a great time to smoke weed. You know why? Because any time is a great time to smoke weed. Absolutely. You want to hear how, how, how it goes from there? No, I'm good. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So the, at this time, uh, the Grateful Dead are touring incessantly to large crowds. And this goes on for like 20 years. And the seeds of 420 are just kind of being scattered from person to person all over the country because the band moves around. This all happens without a single mention in the media or popular culture. Right. Until... In 1990, High Times editor Steve Bloom, literal friend of the podcast, I worked with him at High Times for many years, he was wandering aimlessly outside a dead show when he was handed a flyer soliciting people to, quote, meet at 420 on 420 for 420-ing in Marin County, uh, which is Uh where San Rafael is. Interestingly... Four out of the five last High Times editors were discovered wandering around in the <laughs> Grateful Dead lot. <laughs> yeah, it was the uh, zip recruiter of its day. <laughs> Weed journalists. Weed journalists. You got the goods, kid. So meet 420 on 420 for 420-ing at the Bellinas Ridge Sunset Spot in Marin County. Younger listeners who are still adults, that's how you met people in olden times. Before social media. Before social media. This was a, this guy's trying to start a one guy flash mob smoke out by himself. So this dude's just handing out a flyer and it happens to fall. You know, this is also very like cinematic or if you're into Joseph Campbell and sort of this idea of like this guy handed out a lot of flyers and then this one just happens to go to the dude from High Times. Who um, has the capability of turning 420 into an international sensation. He does. So the flyer also offers an explanation for 420, one that does not mention the Waldos. A competing myth already. Okay, so it's only 1990, right? The Waldo myth has been around for barely two decades. And just as it's propagating, 
There's an alternate myth. Who is this interloper? Well, this is the other thing that's interesting. It's like, so this has been going on for 20 years. These guys are now 20 years older than when they went looking for this weed patch. But they're all still friends. They all still live in the area. And as they describe it, they have like an idea. Like, oh, I saw a 420, you know, graffiti on a wall, some weird place. Or, you know, there's little, little sprinklings of it around. But they're, they've never, like, told their story to anybody or tried to take credit for it. They don't even... It's not really... Sure. It's germinating. It's organically know? spreading. But. Yeah. But what the flyer says is... 420 started somewhere in San Rafael, California in the 1970s. So that part is correct. Ding. As the police code for marijuana smoking in progress. Ah, so here a familiar myth pops up, right? Fake news. Yeah, this is this is some OG <laughs> weed fake news. Well, there's definitely been a lot of weed fake news, like a lot, you know, like mostly basically until the last couple decades. Yeah. But yeah, fake news alert. Fake news Looks alert. like somebody has begun the myth, right? Uh, the uncorroborated myth that 420 was the police code for some crime related to cannabis somewhere in the United States. Yeah, and first of all, random guy from a 1990 dead lot. Uh, first of all, friend of the podcast. Just, we're going to go on faith with that. And we believe that you believed what was on the flyer. I don't think that this guy was, like, trying to take anything away. I yeah, think he just, I'm sure it was not malicious. Like, for one thing, it's not like the Waldos were out there being like, we are the original propagators <laughs> of the myth of the, you know. It, it was just the thing that caught on. So I'm sure the way that went down is one stoner went to another and was like, what, where did this 420 thing come from? And the guy was like trying to just be sound smart and deduce from the situation was like, well, it's a number, it's three digits. You know, the police uses three digit codes for things. We're talking about a drug that's illegal. So perhaps it's that and just throws it out there as an explanation. Boom, a rumor is born. It's not that far out of the realm of imagination, right? And it, it, it the flyer concludes with the immortal words, uh, let's go 420, dude. Let's go 420, which is not how it's used now, really. I mean, you know, to say like 2420, it really has just become a, uh, you know, more about the time. Or just the sort of visual of that number. Or a hashtag. Now, that's a funny thing. Is hashtag 420 or hashtag 420 life is the modern iteration of 420, of the use of it. And none of you kids know where 420 <laughs> came from. You can just be thanking the Waldos every day. <laughs> uh, hashtag thank the Waldos. Yeah. Hashtag 420 life. Hashtag so- GMIWH podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Hashtag, please tell your friends so we can keep doing this because it's a lot of fun. <laughs> so Bloom printed it in its entirety in high times, not as some significant communique meant to like spark a revolution, but just as a kind of goofy artifact that he brought home from Dead Lot. Oh, interesting. So so he printed like a full uh, picture of this thing in the magazine and it said the story about this is a police code for marijuana. Yeah, it was. He just took the flyer and made it a page in the magazine. Now, uh, those of us who have worked at a print publication, those those pages just keep you up at night. Yeah, they're just say, an angry beast that you have to feed. The the, the lazy journalism of just <laughs> throwing a flyer and <laughs> fill up some page space. But you know what? I mean, there's not a lot of magazines where. You could do that and actually get away with documenting something interesting because, hey, look, as lazy as it might have been to throw that in uh, back in 1990, we're talking about it right now. <laughs> oh, with with much significance, you yeah. know. And I, I, you know, I, as you know, I worked there for uh, ten years yeah. and uh, spent a lot of time in the archives. Mm, interesting, I'm fascinating. You know, the magazine started in 1974. You know, it's as old as I am. Yeah, I remember actually uh, a few years ago, like shortly after we met, I was at the High Times office uh, with Chris, who was the editor at the time. And there was a bunch. He was sort of going through uh, some of the archive of like back issues, which is really fascinating uh, because, I mean, you know, at the time, a 40 year old magazine, the ads in these things would blow your mind. And, you know, they really are artifacts of a time like this 420 flyer. Little communique between people in a very specific community. You know what I mean? And that's fucking interesting. It's exactly the type of shit that you found in high times. This flyer just struck a chord. 
uh, with the people who read High Times. They got like letters about it and people were into it and questions and like, what what is this? You hmm. know, it, it just struck a chord. And so High Times started promoting it more and more in the magazine uh, and then really got into that idea of 420 as a time to smoke, which is also in the flyer. Mm-hmm. You know, so he's saying 420 is to smoke. That's the 420-ing. But he's also saying, let's meet at 420 on 420. So this guy is like the Moses of 420. He's right. just something wrong. There's an incorrect thing in the tablets, but that's not his fault. He's just bringing the tablets down. Right, totally. And and, and meaning that, you know, once again, I think it proves that there's something about that number visually and, you know, the way it sounds in English thing, 420, uh, that, you know... It would catch on, right? Like, obviously, look, the, the reason that it changed hands, uh, you know, so many times and ended up uh, popping off at all these different levels is, yeah, there's just something cool about it. You know, it, it just works really well. But that's interesting that it was, you know, really like we might have never heard of it. It might have been, a you know, an in-joke with, you know, Grateful Dead uh, fans or something in, in California, Northern California, or, you know, whatever. But instead, in one step, it goes from being what you know one of those in jokes to really becoming a symbol. Yeah, it starts to build, and so all this is happening, and still no one's heard from the Waldos at this point. And then in 1998, so eight years after he puts the flyer in the magazine, the original five Waldos, who remain close friends to this day, even now, decided to go public. Okay, so they're like, we're the Waldos, we're the guys behind 420, who's got the tree? Somebody blaze us out. (laughs) We're legends in these parts. Yes. So they reunited and they met with a representative from High Times to convince him that their seemingly fantastical story about inventing 420 was not only true, but backed up by a trove of hard evidence. This has since been verified by uh, Huffington Post, as we said. I think The Economist. Many people have looked at these documents. So they have a clipping from their high school yearbook. That was, that was a slow day of economic news. <laughs> <laughs> there hasn't been a slow day of a news. I don't think that that's going to happen again. Yeah. <laughs> Spo- spoiler alert of news. That yeah. that period of existence yeah. is over. They're like, the markets are fine. Obscure weed lore. What about it? You know, it's like, <laughs> the economist. <laughs> yeah, it's like that late 90s where you're like, oh, okay. Yeah. Maybe everything will be okay. <laughs> Uh, spoiler alert to them. <laughs> Turns out, not true. So they've got this uh, high school yearbook with a 420 reference, this flag, um, and they have, to me, most convincing, a postmarked letter uh, from one Waldo to another that makes explicitly clear what 420 really meant. So one of the Waldos has gone off to college, is like the slightly older Waldo. Every stoner crew probably has that one dude who like is the first one to go to college and then you crash on their... Oh, yeah, totally. For a year, and it's it's amazing. An age of discovery. They're like, wait, a bong with two bowls? They're like, you can go to the cafeteria anytime you want. (laughs) And there's like no chance your mom's there. Yeah. (laughs) Okay, so he writes from from home base off to college. uh, My brother uh, got a job as Phil Lesh's manager. Phil Lesh uh, is the bassist of The Grateful Dead. And last weekend, I I had a job as a doorman backstage at a concert. I smoked out with David Crosby and Lash. P.S. Here's a little 420 enclosed for your weekend. Ah, okay. So, and here again, the use of 420 is like using the word, the number 420 to signify actual weed, which is a weird thing to think about that. 420 means weed or time to smoke weed or something. But it never actually anymore in the general context means actual weed. Like you wouldn't say like, I'm going to go get some 420. You just say like 420, dude. As in like, I don't know, weed, you know, like you're saying it, but not like specifically weed, like flowers, right? 420 is to, is to stoners as the word smurf is to smurfs. Yeah, you that's can true. kind of bend its meaning with your context. Yeah, no, that's true. But I find this very, very compelling because it shows the close Grateful Dead connection. It shows the date. Mm-hmm. So there, you know, no one has produced evidence even close showing yeah. the use of 420 to mean 
pot that far back. Right. Um, so it had to be these guys. Basically, they passed all the tests. And also, why would five grown ass men <laughs> uh, fucking construct a multi layered conspiracy to take credit for the invention of 420? And right now, there's a cop in San Rafael, like shaping, shaking his fist and being like, you know, pointing at the code book. And being like, <laughs> right in here 420 the police code for marijuana you know it's like obviously these are the guys these are the guys the next thing that happens is sort of internet culture starts to happen and that gives 420 this huge boost information spreads so fast and i'm sure you'll remember this craigslist ads of the early 2000s were rife with those seeking out 420 friendly roommates Mm -hmm. and uh, romantic partners a lot of uh cannabis enthusiasts would like throw a 420 in your email address and back then it was still a little you know uh, on the low, so not everyone, not your parents wouldn't necessarily know of 420, but now definitely, I mean, it is just everywhere. And the funny thing is, somehow 420, and once again, a testament to just the quality of it as a sheer brand, you know what I mean? And you know what's interesting too is, as a brand, if you think about it as a brand, no one owns the trademark on 420. You can't really own the trademark on 420. It really is a brand that belongs entirely to cannabis users. Now, of course, we've got our invaders, you know, we've got Chipotle and Burger King and Taco Bell trying to, you know, sneak in on it. But fortunately, cannabis users are like the most skeptical segment ever. Most cannabis users would look at that and be like, I see this for what it is, a transparent attempt to capitalize on my cannabis thing, but occasionally you might be like, okay, give me the fucking taco. You know what I mean? And you know, the the numerical nature of this brand was just so lucky, you know, like you're saying, because if it had been, if Waldo Bob's fencing class got out at 450, 450 is not on the calendar. You know what I mean? That's not a day. That's not a day for us to use, right? Yeah. I just say, Kaboom. Yeah, isn't that you just crazy? Blew my mind, yeah. Isn't that kind of nuts to think about? Like, it can be a time, it can be a date. It's a date that's not that close to many other holidays. April. Uh, are you forgetting about Hitler's birthday? Yeah. <laughs> oh, uh, what? Uh, <laughs> just to get it to where it uh, it all wraps up. The next step is sort of uh, popular culture starts to embrace 420 as a way to wink at weed culture from a safe distance. And you see clocks set to 420 and, you know, The Simpsons and all these other places. Every clock in Pulp Fiction, and this is pretty early on the trend, was set to 420, a film that Quentin Tarantino actually wrote in an Amsterdam coffee shop called Betty Boo. No kidding. And Tarantino smokes weed? Uh, He literally hung out in a coffee shop Every day writing uh, Pulp Fiction. So he was definitely blazing. He was definitely blazing. I mean, I've been inside Betty Boop. It's nice. But if you don't smoke weed, you're probably not going to hang out there You're not all day, like, oh, I love the <laughs> chocolate croissants in this shithole. No, they are <laughs> stale as hell. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, some other cool stuff is the Colorado Department of Transportation eventually had to replace mile marker 420 sign on I-70 East with one that reads 419.99 because... People um, kept stealing it. Yeah, they were ganking them. Yeah, that, uh, you know, in my town where I went to high school, exit 42C, right, off of uh, 287 or 80, perhaps, whatever, you know, this was North Jersey. You know, the C was completed into an O. And that was, this had been there forever, and people would call it Exit 420. Yeah, that's, you know, that I just remembered that. And that was like, you know, every single time we would be like, 420. So that's beautiful. That's, you know, I don't think you, that's exactly why it makes you happy when you see it. Yeah. It was that time period. Yeah. Somebody out there, I would bet you that there's a decent chance that the guy who did that might listen to this podcast one day. So if you do, my dude, I hope you're still blazing and you're you're good. Thank you for that. So, and then my favorite is, did you ever see the dude on Price is Right who bid 420 every time? Oh, yeah, yeah. I remember. I think I, I saw this on YouTube. I didn't see the original thing. I would have <laughs> no, I I been out of my recliner. You know what I mean? Like being like, oh, my God. Like those like college days, you know? You know, when you can get your college schedule so that you have days off in the middle of the week. 
Price is right, motherfucker. That's when that shit's happening. Yeah, and who knew that getting high in the middle of the day and watching Price is Right would prepare you for your career path? Yeah, I know. Seriously, man. Hey, TV and weed. I'm vindicated for a life of indulgence. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So here, uh, a beautiful little great moment to wrap it up. And I was actually present for this in 2002 at the High Times Doobie Awards uh, for music in New York City. The Waldos came out on stage together, publicly identifying themselves for the first time in order to present a Lifetime Achievement Award to their favorite band, New Riders of the Purple Sage. Naturally, the band played their most famous song, Panama Red. You know that song? I don't think so. Panama Red. Panama Red. It's about it's about a it's it's a strain. It was a I popular strain of the go 70s. Like that. <laughs> <laughs> and we're gonna yeah, get yeah. letters about this. I've heard I remember that because from Meet the Parents, where uh, you know, where where Ben Stiller goes, I think I can get that high. And then Robert De Niro goes, I bet you could, Panama Red. Uh. Right? <laughs> They all get together, they're on stage, they're giving this award to their favorite band, they play their favorite song, and they were like, dude, we used to play this song. Like, I was there as they're telling the band, like, we used to bump your song while we were going to look for this weed field out in the middle of nowhere, holding this treasure map, and like, they're all still friends. It's just, it was like a real cool moment. They never found the treasure, but... They all remain friends. And isn't that the real treasure in the end? Boom! Hollywood ending without even finding the fucking weed patch. You know what? Sometimes reality does tell a really complete story. And that about wraps it up for this episode of Great Moments in Weed History. Please subscribe to our podcast on iTunes and leave us a nice little review if you're so inclined. And follow us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and SoundCloud at at GMIWH podcast. And please give us a tweet or a post if you like the show. And with that, we'll close it out. Thanks so much. We'll see you next week.